Sparge, which was Edom, down there south of the Dead Sea. And he's just like, you know, I, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to because I think my audience understands where I come from. As I was studying this over the last several days now, I couldn't help but constantly, and it came again now, so evidently I'm supposed to use it. Those of you who are acquainted with northern Minnesota all know the legend of whom? Paul Bunyan. What's the legend of Paul Bunyan? This humongous woodsman who stepped from place to place across Minnesota, and every place he stepped was left a what? A lake. That's the legend of Paul Bunyan. You go up through Bemidji and you'll see a likeness of him. Well, you know, as I look at this, I couldn't help but think, well, this is a supernatural Paul Bunyan. And as he makes each step in his stride, it is not peace and tranquility. It's what? Death and destruction. His wrath. He's not coming like the lowly lamb. He's coming in the power of his wrath and vexation like a great, humongous, Roman-clad soldier just spreading death and destruction. Consequently, in verse 2, what has happened to his apparel? It's splashed with blood. Now, we don't like to think in terms of that with God. But this isn't the God that we're dealing with today. I've got to keep repeating that. God today is the God of love, mercy, and grace. Absolutely. But when this day comes, it's going to be the God of wrath and judgment. And all the Old Testament has been foretelling it. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, warned Israel of it. Paul speaks of it just in one place. And I've always emphasized, Paul doesn't write much prophecy, but he does for just a few verses in 2 Thessalonians 2. But it's coming, beloved. Now, as believers, we're not going to be here. But the scorning, unbelieving world is going to finally come under that wrath and vexation of God, all right, at his second coming. And so he comes looking like someone who has been stomping the grapes in the wine vat. Now, you can imagine what that person would look like, just all splattered with grape juice, and whatever color his clothes, it would just be matted with that residue of the grapes. But this isn't grape juice, beloved. It's blood of mankind, see? All right, now then, verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone. In other words, he's not going to have multitudes of people helping him. This wrath is going to be poured out from God and God alone. All right? And I will tread them in my love and mercy and grace? No, in his what? In his anger. Verse 3. All right, reading on. I will trample them in my fury. Now, this isn't pretty language. I know it isn't. But it, on the other hand, it tells us what the world is getting ready for. Their whole mentality of absolute absence of morality. And we see it on every hand. There is no integrity. There is no anything with reference to God's Word. They are in total rebellion. Now, I'll say it again. I thank the Lord myself the other morning. When you look at the world in general, spiritually and morally speaking, we Americans are still head and shoulders above the rest of the world. As bad as we are, we are still head and shoulders above the Orient or above the Middle East or above Europe. Now, that'll give you a little indication of what it's like. Now, you see, you take Thailand, right in the middle of all this disaster. You know what Thailand is really most known for, especially across Europe? It's the prostitution capital of the world. And we think it's bad here. No, it's not even close. And so when we speak of these things, don't think that God is being unfair. He's been warning the world for centuries of this wrath that's coming. And it's going to be like someone who is treading in the wine vat. And then reading on, finish the verse 3. And I will be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain my raiment. Now this is the coming Christ 
alone who is pouring out wrath and judgment. Now, just to show you how all of Scripture fits, come back with me now to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Now here John is writing after Christ's first advent. And it's in perfect accord with what Isaiah wrote 700 years before. Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to take our time. We haven't taught this on the program since our Revelation series, have we? Way, way, way back. You know, I wish we'd have never put our copyright year on our programs because then people wouldn't have been so aware when we made these. But see, when that copyright is on there, 1996, they'll call and say, Les, are you still making programs? The program this morning you made way back in 96. Well, I wouldn't teach it one bit different today than I did then. So if we'd have just left that off, they wouldn't have known the difference, see? But anyway, Revelation 14. Now look at this. Verse 14. Now again, it's symbolism. But it's coming back to the same literal fact that we've got in Isaiah 63. I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto who? The Son of Man. The word Son is capitalized. It's Christ. And having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, in whatever culture you may live or have lived in the past, what did they use the sickle for? to harvest, see? Now, believe it or not, we were in Amman, Jordan, not too many years ago, and looked out the bus window, and there they were like a, like a bunch of ants out in a wheat field, and they were all harvesting that wheat with that little handheld side. That's just a few years ago. <laughs> but see, it always was indicative of harvesting. Now, here, they're not going to use the side to cut wheat. They're going to use it to cut the grapes off the vine. Okay? This is the symbolism now. And so the Son of Man, Christ himself, is pictured like someone harvesting grapes. Verse 15, Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, or harvest, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What does it mean by that? ripe for judgment. God has now put up with their rejection for 6,000 years, culminating in the ungodliness of our present day. Now again, I always have to explain some of these things. Why does God pour out such horrible judgment on one generation of people? How can he ignore all those that go clear back to Adam? Well, I've always stressed it with one word. Numbers. Numbers. See, there are more people living on the planet today, almost, I don't think I'll miss it very far, there are almost as many people living on the planet today as have lived all the way back through human history. Now, we can't picture that. In fact, I was just reading something again the other night. Do you realize that most of the present-day world was totally unknown and uninhabited? until about 1,000 to 1,200 A.D.? Think about that. The whole Western Hemisphere was pretty well uninhabited and unknown until after 1,000 A.D., and the same way with much of the South Sea Islands and so forth. So you see, the world's population was relatively small. I think I read one time that at the time of Christ, the total population was only like 500 million. That's one half of one billion. That's a lot of people. But nothing compared to the seven plus that we are today. And so when God's wrath and judgment is poured out on this final generation, he is literally dealing with almost as many people as have lived down through the centuries. Now that should answer the question, then. why should this generation suffer so? Because they are symbolically representative of all that's gone before. All right, read on. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out who had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him who had the sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather, or bring together, 
the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now, naturally, in all of antiquity, and in fact, in many places of the world today, what was the staple drink? Well, the grape juice or the wine. And so here was the indication then that when they gathered the ripe, the ripe grapes, where did they go? Into the wine vat. They didn't go to the supermarket. They went into the wine vat. All right? So he says, verse 19, Gather the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now again, this is symbolic language. What was a wine vat? Well, it was an enclosure. Not all that big. And at the bottom was the drain where they could crush the grapes. And so if we're dealing now symbolically with the human race, what will be God's wine vat into which he will put the masses? The valleys, especially of Israel. The valley of Megiddo. The valley of Sharon. The Jericho Valley. See, little Israel is divided by all these separate valleys. They're going to be packed full of the armies of the world that are still left. 200 million coming from the Orient. And when I taught the Revelation series, you remember I, I made the illustration. This is under a supernatural set of circumstances. Those generals are going to do things that would ordinarily be considered absolutely stupid. Why pack all your troops into those valleys? They're going to do it. They're going to pack them in like sardines in the can. And you have no idea how many million men you can put in just a square mile. It's unbelievable when you read figures on it. And so millions are going to be packed into these valleys of Israel and waiting for then the treader of the grapes. And who will that be? The second coming of Christ. Now, I think he's going to use the physical elements. He isn't actually going to walk in them. That's a symbolic term. But you see, it's amazing that the last great plague that is listed in the book of Revelation is which one? Remember? The hundred pound <coughs> hailstones. That's the final plague. And now I do take the liberty here. The Bible doesn't explicitly say that. But I feel that once these armies of the world are packed into the valleys of Israel, then the hundred pound hailstones will be God's treader of the grapes. All right, read on. You'll get the picture. Verse 20. The wine press was trodden outside the city. In other words, we know that all these valleys in Israel are beyond Jerusalem. You got the Hula Valley up north of Galilee. And then you got the Valley of Megiddo just running off the north end of Galilee. And I've already mentioned the Valley of Sharon along the Mediterranean Sea. You got the Jordan Valley coming down from Galilee to the Dead Sea. All those valleys packed full of the army's troops or the world's troops. And now look. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press. Not grape juice, blood. So who are the grapes? Mankind. And the blood will run as deep as the horse's bridles for a space of 1,600 furlongs. That's about 180 miles. Well, if you know your geography, that's about the distance from the Hula Valley down to the Red Sea. And it's going to be a little literal river of blood mixed with water. Now let's see if I can find the verse that I want. The final plague, I think that's in chapter... Wow, I should have looked it up. See, I didn't intend to do this. That'd be in chapter 16. Yeah, chapter 16, verse 21. Chapter 16, verse 21. This is the final plague. Verse 21, and I don't think it takes a lot of imagination. The only thing that I'm showing that is really supernatural is how the armies of the world will pack into the valleys of Israel. That, of course, I'm using my, my own whatever. The Bible doesn't just say that, but it certainly is indicative. If God is putting his wrath upon a grape vat, 
then that means it has to be within an enclosure. And what better way to pick an, uh, picture an enclosure than a valley? And so that's where I get my thinking. All right, but now look at the final plague. And there fell upon men, not grapes, men, a great hail out of heaven. Every stone the weight of a talent. Now, if you've got a marginal help in your Bible, most of them say the same thing. How much was a talent? 100 pounds. 100 pound hailstones. Now, it's amazing that not too long ago, I read in our, I think it's in our Daily Oklahoman, that there have been miraculous phenomena the last couple of years in various places around the earth where on a clear day, great chunks of ice will just simply fall out of the, ground, out of the air, up to 100 pounds in weight. So we're not stretching anything here. This is already happening in isolated places. All right, so 100-pound hailstones will fall upon these multitudes of men gathered now in the valleys of Israel. But does it change their thinking? Uh-uh. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for it was exceedingly great. Well, now earlier in the tribulation, you have the same thing. Come back up with me to, uh, oh, let's see, chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, and this again after listing some of the trumpet judgments, which will be shortly after, I think, the middle of the tribulation. But see, men don't change their attitude toward God. Revelation 9, dropping down to verse 21. Even after all the severe physical judgments that have come upon the planet, this is the result. Great revival? Uh-uh. Verse 21. Neither repented they of their murders, their sorceries. Now, I remember in my earlier lessons, I pointed out, what's the other word for sorceries? Pharmakia which means drugs, so it'll be a drug culture. They don't repent of their murders, nor their drugs, nor of their fornication, the gross immorality, nor of their thefts. Doesn't change them. Doesn't change their thinking. Doesn't change their lifestyle one iota. All right, but I think I've got time to show this. Out of that will come a remnant who will become believers. Now come back with me to chapter 7. Chapter 7, and this is where I call the fulfillment of the Great Commission. The 144,000 young Jewish men. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, honey. Revelation 7, verse 9. So in the midst of all of this wrath and outpouring, God's 144,000 Jews are going to be proclaiming salvation. Now watch where it goes. Verse 9. After this, after the sealing of the 144,000, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Now watch where they come from. Of all nations. See? See? That's why I call this the fulfilling of the Great Commission. They're going to come from all nations <clears throat> and kindreds and people and tongues. But see, they've already been martyred. They're already pictured before the throne. They're no longer on the planet. And they're before the Lamb clothed with white robes. And then verse 10, and they've cried, Salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne. So what's the picture? that as these 144,000 Jews circumvent the globe, preaching the gospel not of the grace of God, but the gospel of the kingdom, there are going to be multitudes saved, but they'll be martyred immediately. The powers that be will know who they are, and they will be able to isolate them. But they'll only be a small percentage, as always. Now, that may be a great number. You know, Tim LaHaye, in one of his books, claims that he feels... The 144,000 will have more converts in those six and a half years than the church has had in 1900. Well, I'm not going to argue the point, but I think it's a stretch. But there's still going to be a lot of them. But compared to the whole, just a small percentage. That's the way it's always been. 
And so they will be martyred just as fast as they profess their faith. But you see, they can't kill the 144,000 because they're sealed with the mark of God. But nevertheless, this is all just indicative of what the world is getting ready for. And the more you watch the news, the more you can see that it's coming. Because God's grace isn't going to last forever. His patience is going to run out. And if I haven't made any other point today, I hope I make this. Don't blame God. It's not his fault. It's because of their constant rejection of his glorious gospel of the grace of God. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, program number four for this afternoon, and uh, then we'll be ready to head for home. For those of you joining us on television, again, that's what we like you to know, that we're taping four programs in a row, because otherwise you know what they do. They call and want to know, you know, if I've only got one shirt. And uh, no, it's just that we have four programs in a row. Everybody's sitting in pretty much the same place, and uh, that's just our format. But again, we'd like to welcome you to an informal Bible study. We just search the Scriptures, compare Scripture with Scripture, and uh, just let the Scripture do its own work. But uh, we do like to thank our television audience for your response. My, our letters are just unbelievable. And uh, the hearts and lives that God is transforming from every walk of life imaginable. A uh, gentleman called. He hoped to be here this afternoon, and evidently uh, the weather didn't cooperate. But when he first came up and told me how our program had been instrumental in changing his life, he was telling me how bad he was. And I said, well, now you... What do you mean, how bad you were? And he said, less I was in prison, more than I was out. And he said, it has just totally transformed my life. And he has. He's become a real instrument. He's touching a lot of lives himself. And uh, so that's what keeps us going. That's the best compensation a person could ever get. Okay, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to start with Isaiah, simply because I told the studio audience, if I got a different scripture up there than Isaiah, they're going to call and ask, well, I thought we were in Isaiah this program. So we're going to start with Isaiah, because this is where I really thought we'd be by this time. Haven't made it, so I'm going to jump ahead. Next taping, we'll back up and pick up what I've skipped. But I want you to look down at 64, verse 5. And then I think you'll see what, ver what word I'm heading for. The last word in the verse, saved. All right, verse 5. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth or angry. For we have sinned. See, that's the problem. For we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be, what? Saved. All right, now read on. But we are all as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. All right, now let's just jump up to the New Testament and pick up this same concept. And you've heard me say it more than once on the program over the years. 
You can't be saved until you know that you're what? Lost. Now, what did this verse just tell us? That Israel realized that they had sinned. Their iniquities were just compounded. And all their so-called self-righteousness was like what? Filthy rags. Now, that's even more filthy than what we normally think of. The filthy rags here were really the cast-off rags of a leper with all of its filth. That's what self-righteousness is in God's eyes. All right, so we're going to use this half hour, <clears throat> since I've been talking so much about the wrath of God that's coming upon Christ rejecting mankind, so that no one who hears my voice will be able to say if they find themselves in that kind of wrath and vexation, well, God, you're unfair and never had a chance. Well, after this half hour, anybody who hears my voice cannot say that because we're going to make it as plain as I think the English language can make it. How can you escape the wrath of God, whether it's the tribulation or whether it's the eternal doom that goes beyond? Now I'm going to have you jump up with me then to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. And this, of course, is from the lips of the Lord Jesus himself. And uh, it is probably a parable. But it speaks volumes with regard to what I just said. You can't get saved until you know you're lost. See, that's the problem with the vast majority of Christendom. How many times haven't you heard people say, well, I've always been saved. I've always believed. Now, wait a minute. You never came to the place that you knew you were lost? Well, they look at you with a blank stare. They don't know what you're talking about. You can't be saved until you know that you're lost. All right, this is the perfect example from the lips of the Lord himself. Luke 15, and we'll start at verse 3, honey. Luke 15, verse 3. Oh, by the way, I was going to announce once more before the day is over. I've got my eldest son and his wife are with us today, and, of course, we work cattle together, and... Uh, and it's been a long time we've gotten mad at each other, so I guess we're both <laughs> getting news to each other. But uh, we, we've done a lot of cattle work together over the years, and uh, we've gotten along pretty good as father and son goes. And uh, he's also been part and parcel of answering the phone, so a lot of you have heard him say, this is Les's son. Well, uh, there he is. He's on the, on the picture, and his wife, Jeanette, and uh, she's been more and more involved in the ministry. And it just uh, exemplifies the fact that we're just a family ministry. And uh, we thank the Lord for it. And I guess it wouldn't hurt for me to mention our daughter, Laura. Many of you out even in television have understood that she's had a tragic accident and is presently paralyzed. And uh, we trust that the day will come when she will be restored. But we don't know that as yet. But anyway, we're family. And uh, we just praise the Lord for that. All right, back to Luke 15 now then, verse 3. And Jesus is speaking of a parable to the Jew. Now remember, Jesus never addressed the Gentile world. Everything he spoke was to Israel and under the system of law. But we can still draw a tremendous lesson. And he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose... There's the key word. If he lose one of them, <clears throat> doth he not leave the ninety and nine, not in the fold, where? In the wilderness. Now, in Middle Eastern language, what's the wilderness? The desert. You know, whenever I used to think of wilderness when I was a kid, I always thought of trees and forests and no man's land. No, in the Middle East, the wilderness is the barren, open desert with a clump of something here and a clump there and a lot of sand in between. All right, so one of these hundred is lost and the rest are out in the wilderness. Now remember, this is dealing with Israel. We're merely going to draw an application. Okay, so he says he's going to go after that which is lost, the one out of the hundred. And he's going to search until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying, 
Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was, past tense, what? Lost. Now, the one is saved by virtue of the shepherd's love and determination to find him. Who are the other 99 indicative of? Well, the rank and file of unbelieving Israel, who were lost and didn't know it. But the one that was bleeding off in a canyon someplace was lost and knew it. And so that's the one the shepherd went to seek. Now, again, I think I don't want to leave this parable without fully uh, describing the situation. When the ninety and nine were left out there on that barren desert, and the shepherd leaves to find the one that is lost, what happens to the ninety and nine? They become more and more lost. Sheep without a shepherd are hopeless. And that was the rank and file of Israel. The more they rejected their offering of the Messiah and the King, the more lost they became. And consequently, when the time arrived, they were ready to say what? Away with him. Crucify him. We'll not have this man to rule over us. But the picture is that the one that was lost and knew it, the shepherd could save. All right, now then, let's just come all the way up and see how Paul puts it in his epistles, Romans chapter 3. And this has to be, in my understanding, the first step towards salvation. The understanding that we're sinners and that we're lost. And we need salvation. All right, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all, and that means exactly what it says, not one human being can escape that word all. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isn't that exactly what Isaiah said? We've sinned. We've got nothing going for us. And they were all falling short of the glory of God. Well, it's no different now from the pen of the Apostle Paul. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right, now back up a page or two to Romans chapter 1. And that's the verse I had Sharon put on the board because I want our television audience to understand that we're jumping from Isaiah and going up to the New Testament this half hour to just simply make plain how to be saved. And I hope I can make it plain enough that no one can complain that I was confusing the issue. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now this is from the pen of the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to a Gentile congregation in Rome. And he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to Everyone that, what? Believeth and nothing. That's it. It's not believeth and is baptized. It isn't and believes and repents. It isn't and believes and this or that or some other thing. The power of the gospel falls on that lost person who realizes he's lost, that he's a sinner, he needs salvation, but he can believe the gospel, and God immediately does everything that needs to be done. All right, so what's the gospel that we're to believe? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and this is the gospel, and there is no other. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verse 4. Now, I'm going to wait until everybody finds it because they'll call for my TV audience. I can't find them fast enough. Slow down. Okay, we're going to take our time. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 1. Now, remember, Paul over and over makes it so plain that he is the apostle of the Gentiles. And consequently, it's from his writings that we gain our doctrine for salvation, for the Christian walk, and also the hope for
for the end. All right, moreover, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. There's only one. Which I preached unto you, not Jesus, not Peter, not John, Paul. Which I preached unto you, and which also you have received. He's writing to believers, remember. And wherein you stand, not movable with every wind of doctrine. Now verse 2, by which. Now what's he talking about? The gospel. By which you are what? Saved. See? Just the same word that Isaiah used. By which you are saved. If you keep in memory. Or if you understand. You can't just take something like this blindly. You have to know what you believe. So if you have kept in memory that which I preached unto you, lest you have believed in vain. In other words, you have to know what you believe in order to latch on to it by your faith. Now here comes the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now when Paul speaks of receiving something, from whom and from where? Well, from the ascended Lord in glory. And this is the point I'm constantly trying to make to people when they spend all their time in what Christ said in his earthly ministry. That was before the cross. And as I've mentioned on this program not too long ago, for us today, everything that accounts for our salvation at least begins at the cross. Now naturally, I love to teach the Old Testament. It's all background. Of course it is. But that's not where you gain salvation. Salvation begins at the cross. See? All right, reading on. So he said, That which I also receive from the ascended Lord in glory. He's the one that told the Apostle Paul, This is the message for the Gentile world. How that? Christ died for our sins. According to the Scriptures. But you know what? I just explained to someone on the phone the other morning. How many times don't you hear an invitation for salvation? Or you may read it in tracts. I watch every tract now that comes across my desk to be sure. How many times don't they talk about the fact that Christ died for you, but they never mention the resurrection? You know what I'm talking about. Listen, they're dropping the most powerful half of the gospel. Of course Christ had to die. Of course his blood had to be shed. But Christ in the tomb couldn't save anybody. But what did it take? The power of resurrection. And again, Christendom glibly speaks of the resurrection. And I maintain that's wrong. The resurrection was the total power of the sovereign God to overcome death and sin and the curse and raised him from the dead. And without that power, we're just as lost as a goose. You can believe in his death all you want to, but until you couple it up and bring in the power of resurrection, you're still lost. Because the gospel is not half a gospel, it's a total and so now that's why we use this whole two verses here. How that Christ died for your sins. Absolutely he did. According to the scriptures. Absolutely he did. But it didn't stop there. That he was buried. And after those three days and three nights, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That was God's plan for the human race. That not only would he be lifted up and die the death of crucifixion, but he would be dead and in the tomb for three days to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, and then broke out in power and victory and glory, not just for himself, but that he might impart that eternal life to every human being who will what? Believe it. Believe it. 
And I think I've shared, maybe at least with my Oklahoma class, if not on the program, I had a lady from South Carolina who was in such doubt. She didn't know whether she was saved or lost. She'd gone through all the right format and everything, but still no assurance. And I finally said, lady, have you ever flown on an airliner? Some of you heard me give this, so forgive me. Have you ever flown on an airliner? And she said, well, yes, yeah, several times. I will tell me, did you go back and find your seat, buckle your seat belt, maybe start reading a magazine, then all of a sudden get that pang of maybe they're not going where I'm supposed to go? And you unbuckle the seat belt, you throw aside your magazine, and you run to the front of the plane. Are you sure this plane is going to where I'm going? I said, have you ever done that? And she said, well, of course not. I said, well, then you tell me that you have more faith in a man-made airplane and airline than you do in the Word of God? She said, I never thought of it that way before. I said, look, the book says that when you believe that Christ died for you and he rose from the dead and you trust it to the point that you can just sit down and relax, then God says you're saved. And it's up to you to believe it. Now, that's how simple it is. But see, they don't like the simplicity. You know what 99 out of 100 people would rather do? Work. They'd rather go to Mass every week. They'd rather take communion every week. They'd rather give 20% of their income every week. Yeah, some of them think they have to give 20. And they think they have to get baptized. They think they have to do this. See, they complicate it. And God says, you believe it. Nothing left to do. And believe and trust that God has done everything that needs to be done. That's the simplicity of the gospel. And forget the works. That'll come later. That's the result of salvation, not the precursor of it. All right, now in the few minutes we have left, let's just look at some more scriptures. Let's come back to Romans once again. Chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And this, if you're talking to friends or loved ones or co-workers or neighbors, this is what you have to emphasize. It's not by what you do. It's by recognizing the need. You're lost. And you need to be saved. And what will save you? Believing the work of the cross. Plus nothing. All right? Romans chapter 3, after that verse we just read, for all have sinned and come short, go right on down to 24. Being justified. Now that's a tremendous term. And when God declares us as justified, there is nothing left against us. We are scot clean. All right? So being justified freely by His grace, not because of what you've done, but by His grace, through the redemption or the process of buying us back out of the market of Satan, the, the slave market of Satan, He bought us back with His blood. That was the payment in full, which is verse 25. He has set forth to be a propitiation. In other words, all that was required through faith in His blood. And where was the blood aspect? At the cross. That's where his blood was shed, at the cross. Not in his earthly ministry, at the cross. All right? That he might declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance or the patience of God. And then verse 26, to declare at this time his righteousness. Now, you remember what the righteousness of mankind was compared to in Isaiah? Filthy rags. It's no different in our day than it was back then. Self-righteousness is nothing but filthy rags in God's sight. And oh, what a great disappointment that's going to bring to multitudes of people. Well, I did this, and I did that. I gave this, and I gave that. Filthy rags. All right, then read on. That at this time he will declare his righteousness so that, now that's the point I want to make, so that he might be what? Just. God will never cut corners for anybody. He will never be anything but totally fair. 
and he's going to be just and be the justifier. Now, you know, that's just like the legal terms of a leasee and a leasor. Here we have the justifier who has justified the justifiee. Got him? The justifier and the sinner. And he's going to declare that sinner justified when he does what? Believes. You know what that means? There's going to be a lot of people in heaven. And a lot of the other people that went the other way are going to think shouldn't have been there. Did I lose you? <laughs> How many people who are working, 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 and they're so busy, and they're so self-righteous, and that poor old degraded sinner is going to go to glory and he's going the other way? They don't like to admit that. But that's the way it's going to be. That's the way it's going to be. Now, even in Christ's earthly ministry, what did those pompous Pharisees say when the prostitute poured the oil upon the head of the Lord Jesus? Well, that's a sinner. What's the matter with that foolish woman? She's throwing good aromatic oil away. And what was Jesus' answer? You remember in so many words? Hey, she's going to be where you would like to be. Why? Because in her faith, she knew who Jesus was. Well, it's going to be the same way with the vast multitudes of humanity. All right, so we're justified by the justifier because we believe the gospel. All right, let's turn over to Romans chapter 5. I'm just going to take a few of these verses until the clock says we have to stop. And it's just about there, believe it or not. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, because of all that we've seen here in chapter 3 and then in chapter 4, Paul emphasizes that Abraham did nothing but believe. And that's what we have to do. All right, consequently, he comes now to verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith and no, plus nothing. Justified by faith plus nothing. Now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Okay, now let's come on over to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. I guess if I would be put on the spot and ask immediately one verse in Scripture, this would be it. This would be the first one I would come up with. Romans 8, verse 1. What a promise. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore, because of all that Paul has been laying out in these first seven chapters, because of all that, there is no condemnation. Not one word will God bring against the believer. Ever. Even though we may disappoint him, we may lose reward, but God will never point the accusing finger at the believer. We are justified. We're forgiven. We are all these good things that anyone could ever hope to have. Consequently, there will be no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, how do we get in Christ? You know, I had a fellow in Indianapolis. He said, Les, I'm always hearing preachers talk about being in Christ, but they don't tell you how to get there. <laughs> well, I think maybe a lot of times that's true. How do you get in Christ? By believing the gospel. By believing the gospel. Now, I think we've got time real fast. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. This is how we get in Christ. The moment we believe, I'm going to have to go ahead with you, fine or not. Only got 10 seconds left on that clock back there. And this is how we get into it. By the one Spirit, we are all baptized into the body of Christ. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 
369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see you folks in. Now, uh, again, I might as well let our television audience know that we've got a lot of empty chairs and uh, one of those rare events when Tulsa weather just didn't cooperate that much. But uh, we're thankful for these hardy souls that have come in for our taping this afternoon. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and we just thank the Lord for a beautiful day in Oklahoma. And uh, we just pray that uh, as we open the Scriptures again today, the hearts will be blessed from one end of this country to the other. And for those of you joining us on television, and we know that every day we have new listeners, and we just pray that uh, the Spirit will just open your understanding and uh, understand, too, that we're just an informal Bible study. We aren't associated with any particular group or there are no one underwriting us. All of our needs are met with mostly $50 to $100 checks, some five. But uh, we just thank the Lord that He always meets our every need. So for those of you out there who pray for us, for those of you who are giving, writing to us, we just want to thank the Lord for every one of you. Then for all of you here in the studio, we just thank you that uh, you take the effort and uh, the time to come in and be part of this with us. Okay, we're in the beginning now of book number 62. And uh, the next 12 programs will be part and parcel then of book 62. How much will be in Isaiah? I'm not sure yet. But uh, these first four programs for sure will be. So Isaiah 57, we're going to pick up pretty much where we left off in our last taping. And uh, remember now that the book of Isaiah, I guess I should do this at the beginning of every four programs, just keep reminding our folks that Isaiah writes 700 years before Christ. He writes almost 100 years before the Babylonian captivity, which is what he's really warning the people of things to come, that the enemy will be overrunning them. But on the other hand, remember, Isaiah doesn't live in his, limit his prophecy to just the... Uh, oncoming Babylonian captivity, but he's also looking forward to the Roman destruction of the city in 70 AD when they would be dispersed into every nation of the world. And then he also looks forward over to the very end and the tribulation and the second coming of Christ. So as we've been stressing, you have to almost dissect it yourself. Is he talking about the near term? Is he talking about the mid term? Or is he talking about the final end. Some of them all meld together. But uh, whatever the warnings and everything concerning Israel are with the view that one day the glory of the Lord will still come upon them in spite of their unbelief and their rebelliousness. So the whole book of Isaiah is almost a roller coaster of the spiritual climate of the nation of Israel. When they are in a spiritual high, the Lord is blessing them. And then it isn't long until they go down into abject wickedness and idolatry. And of course, after the Babylonian captivity, the Jews were never again guilty of idolatry. That's one of the unique things of Scripture. Uh, idolatry was the thing that caused God's wrath, that caused the judgment that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. But when they came back from the 70 years in Babylon, they never again were guilty of idolatry. But as Isaiah writes, this is the number one thing that God has against the nation, is their abject falling into idolatry to such a pitiful extent, as we're going to see here in the very first few verses, that even Israel, God's chosen people, would go so far down into abject idolatry as to do the things that they did. All right, verse 3 
Isaiah 57. Brought, but draw nigh hither, ye sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer, and the prostitute. Now, why in the world such language? Well, in antiquity, to refer to someone as the son of a prostitute was about as low a term as you could put on him. It was just a term of scornfulness. And so this is how God is referring to his chosen people, Israel. And now remember that whenever you see the sexual connotations here, it's not physical, it's spiritual. When we speak of adultery here, it's not physical adultery. It was spiritual adultery when Israel would start having relationships with pagan gods and goddesses instead of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So always keep that in mind. We're not talking about physical sexuality here. We're talking about the spiritual uh, relationship of Israel with foreign gods compared to the God of Abraham. All right, so here is how he refers to the children of Israel. A term of scorn. You who are the offspring of a prostitute. And remember that even Hosea, by illustration, married a prostitute who gave him children but went back to the street and finally comes back and becomes a restored, forgiven wife of Hosea, which again is just a typical picture of Israel. All right, now verse 4. Against whom do you sport yourselves? Against whom do you make a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Now, you know, I had to read that three, four times before it hit me. You know what he's talking about? What do kids do when they want to... They stick out the tongue. Well, that's exactly the e expression used here. And you know what? It happened during the campaign, didn't it? Yeah, one of our ladies in the middle of the campaign stuck out her tongue at somebody. Well, there's nothing new. It's way back here in Isaiah's day. And so that's what Israel was doing to God. They were literally sticking out their tongue at him. See, in scornful rebellion. Interesting, isn't it? You know, whenever I bring some of these things out of Isaiah, I, I get a kick out of you in the, in the audience, how you suddenly catch on that this is exactly what's in vogue today. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> Everything that has been will be. Ecclesiastes tells us. All right. So he says, and you stick out the tongue? Are you not children of transgression? Are you not a seed of falsehood? They are absolutely ignorant of truth, but they're steeped in falsehood, false religions. All right. Now verse 5. And flaming yourselves with idols under every green tree. What were they doing? Wherever there was a tree, they had an idol. And they were constantly worshiping those idols. Israel. Now, we're not talking about Gentile. We're not talking about the Egyptians or the Babylonians. These are Israelites, see? All right. Now watch the next portion. This is enough to make your stomach turn. Slaying the children, the babies, the little ones, in the valleys under the cliffs of the rock. Now, in order to get the full explanation of that verse, I have to bring you up to, and then we'll come back and pick up the interval, but come up with me a minute to verse 9. And thou wentest to the king. Now, the word king here in the Hebrew is the Hebrew or the uh, pagan god Moloch. Now, most of you remember that Moloch was associated with what? Fire. He was called the fire god. And the, the depiction of the idol was a huge, ugly-looking thing with great outstretched arms. And what would they do with those arms? Heat them white hot and then lay their children on them as an offering to this pagan god. That was Israel. Unbelievable. All right, so here it is in verse 9. Thou wentest to the king. You went to that great idol Moloch with ointment to pacify, and you did increase thy perfumes and did send thy messengers far off. In other words, the prophets like Isaiah, get out of here. We don't want you around here. We want to do this by ourselves. And so as they laid their children on these white-hot arms of Moloch, 
you did debase thyself even unto hell. All right, now then, this valley referred to in verse 5 was actually, I think, in another place here in the section. We may come up to it later. It was the, the valley of Tophet, T-O-P-H-E-T, -E the valley of Tophet. And the word tof in the Hebrew was drum. Okay, now I'll put all this together. This valley in which this fire god Moloch was located and where they offered their little infant children and their small children on those white hat arms of Moloch, what would those children do? Scream! Now, in order to die out or to cover up the screams, what would they do? Beat the drums. And that's what the word tof means in Hebrew, a drum. And so it was called the Valley of Drums in order to drown out the hideous screams of their little children. Isn't it awful? Yeah. Now, just reading an account of a friend that just came back from Thailand, and he left me some stuff to read, and uh, some of the people amongst whom he was working not too many years ago were being intensely persecuted by the Burmese. And it showed a picture of a fellow who had escaped them but before he escaped, they had actually held his feet in open fire to burn him so that he couldn't walk. Well, now, see, we're not accustomed to that kind of stuff in America, but that's what's going on around the world. And I told, uh, I told Mike that as he left, and I said, you know, almost every morning I pray that the Lord will come quickly, not to take us out of our misery. We've got it pretty good. But for the sake of people like that who in other areas of the world are suffering, beyond our comprehension for whatever reason or another. And not only just in the area of Christianity, but in the area of you take Africa and the Sudan, and these people are just being murdered and slaughtered. And so it behooves us to just pray that the Lord will come. But see, it's been this way since antiquity, where people have been brought into places of such suffering. All right, come back to verse 5 then again. And this is what the picture, that they were bringing their little children and offering them to the fire god Moloch under the noise of these incessant drums that would drown out, hopefully, the screams of their little ones. All right, inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Now verse 6, among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. Now, unless you understand some of antiquity, that, that doesn't mean much. What do you suppose they were doing with these smooth stones from the creek bed? Making them an idol. Now, watch the rest of the verse, and then it'll make sense. They, these smooth stones from the creek bed, they are thy lot, even to them, these stones, worthless stones. Thou hast poured out a drink offering. Well, to whom would people pour out a drink offering? A God. See how ridiculous people can get? We think it's bad. <laughs> hey, we don't know the half of it. Now, I know we've got a segment in our society that are all in a dither. They can't imagine that people would vote based on moral values. They don't get it. They can't comprehend that. But listen, Israel was even further down than that. They would actually go find a nice smooth stone in a creek bed, take it home and make it an idol and then pour out drink offerings to it, see? Now then, God says to these Israelites, should I receive comfort in these? Is that part of your worship of me? Well, absolutely not. Now verse 7, upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Now the word bed here, again, is an altar, a pagan altar. Even thither, Thou wentest up to offer sacrifice, see? Not to a sleeping bed, but to an altar. Now verse 8, Behind the doors also and the posts hast thou set up thy remembrance, for thou hast discovered thyself to another than me. Now again, what does the term discover thyself mean? Take off the clothes. Like someone preparing for an adulterous act physically. Can't do it until they take off the clothes. Well, that's exactly what's mentioned here. Israel nationally had literally taken off their spiritual clothes to 
appear to the pagan gods as something that they would want to have in, in uh, relationship with. So here's the language. Thou hast uh, gone up to offer sacrifice. You have let them discover thyself to another than me. You are gone up. You have enlarged thy altar. Again, instead of the word bed. And you have made thee a covenant with them. Who? Pagan gods. With pagan gods. Now, lest you think that this is just uniquely Isaiah, we do this quite often. It's because it's just so graphically easy to understand. Turn with me to Jeremiah 44. Now again, you've got to remember that Jeremiah is much the same kind of a prophet, but he's writing approximately 100 years later. Jeremiah is now writing at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Isaiah is writing 100 years before it. But their prophecies coincide so beautifully because they're both dealing with the same wickedness in the nation of Israel, idolatry. All right, Jeremiah 44, starting at verse 15. Now, don't forget, this is Israel, the Israelites, the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses. They've got the temple down there at Jerusalem. The law, of course, has almost been lost. They don't even know where it is. Verse 15, Jeremiah 44. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, and all the women that stood by who were guilty of that, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelled in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, and Sermiah. Now, these are Jews who had been down in those four nations. They answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of Jehovah, we will not hearken or listen to you, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. What is that? That's rebellion. They're not going to do what God says to do. All right, we're going to burn incense unto who? The queen of heaven, a female goddess. And whenever, whenever mankind back in antiquity worshipped the female goddesses, the sexual immorality went to the greatest depths. That was just part and parcel of the worship of these female goddesses. All right, we burned incense to the queen of heaven to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we, our fathers, our kings, our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Imagine. For then we had plenty of victuals and we were well and saw no evil. Now that was a lie because it was the other way around, see? But since we left off burning incense to the queen of heaven, and we have stopped pouring out drink offerings unto her. We have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. They got it wrong. Why were they being consumed by famine and the sword? Because they were worshiping the queen of heaven instead of the God of heaven. Isn't it amazing how the human race can be so, uh, what's the word? Ignorant? Idiotic? <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Okay, back to Isaiah 57. My, this time just about gone already. Verse 9. Thou wentest to the king. You went to the god Moloch with ointment and didst increase thy perfume. In other words, to enhance their approach to this god. And you sent thy messengers, the prophets, afar off. You didn't want them around telling you how guilty you were. And you debase thyself even unto hell. Now verse 10. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. Yet sayest thou not, there is no hope. Thou hast found the life of thy hand. Therefore thou wast not grieved. And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me, God says through the prophet, nor laid it to thy heart. Have I not held my peace? God says, haven't I been long-suffering with you? And, uh, and how I have of old, you fearest me not. Now verse 12, 
I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them. But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. In other words, don't forget there was always that small percentage of believers even in abject, idolatrous Israel. There was still that small segment of believers. And those believers are still going to inherit the promises of Israel's God. All right, now verse 14. And they shall say, cast you up, cast you up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus saith the high and lofty one, another term for God, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. In other words, a believer in Israel had that relationship with the God of Abraham just as well as some of the patriarchs themselves. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones, that is, the true believers. Now verse 16, we're going to move on quickly because I want to get into a, a later chapter in the next program. For God says, I will not contend forever, neither will I be always angry, for the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made for the iniquity of his covetousness. Now, whenever you see the word covetousness in the Old Testament, it usually is associated with idolatry. Coveting and idolatry, and even Paul will put those two words together over and over. They were hand in glove, coveting and idolatry. All right, for the iniquity then of their idolatry, I was wroth and smote him. I hid me, and I was angry, and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. Speaking of Israel as a nation. I have seen his ways, and will heal him. I will lead him also, and restore comforts unto him and to his mourner. Now verse 19, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith the Lord. I will heal him. Now that reminds me of a verse way up in Romans, and let's just see how Paul puts it, because we still like to compare Scripture with Scripture whenever possible. Come up with me to Romans chapter 10. And Paul uses almost the same language for us today. Even though chapter 10 is directed first and foremost to Jewish people, yet it is so appropriate for us. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 6, honey. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. Romans 10, verse 6. Now, this is Paul. And he said, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring